we're going to spend all day today talking specifically about the executive branch. We've already begun this. As you recall, we've, we've, uh, we started pretty early on in the class looking at that Pacificus Helvidius debate. And we're still, the reason that, that I, I emphasize the executive branch so much in the course in general and now specifically taking this week is not surprisingly, the president arguably was and maybe has become an even more important figure in our government. I mean, the Congress doesn't seem to be up, up front and center. I mean, it's Barack Obama that, that people look to. Um, for answers for things. We're not looking for our congressmen and our senators, particularly, at least on the front end here, for, for solid answers on things. So the presidency has become particularly important. It's evolved. We're going to look at this notion, which you, you had a chance to read over break, of the modern presidency and see if that holds anything. Um, is Barack Obama a modern president and George Washington was a non-modern president? We'll, we'll wrestle with that a little bit today. So I want to I want to take a little bit and review some concepts that you'd be familiar with, and then add to them today, and then in the second half of class we'll we'll talk about this notion of a modern presidency. So this is what we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to get a chance to look at and revisit something that you've already had a chance to read. Um, a little debate that took place around the turn of the last century between a couple presidents about the nature of executive power. One guy's pretty biblical, or he takes himself to be pretty biblical, and his successor, about a 300-pound gentleman named William Howard Taft, uh, thinks he's wrong about something. But what's particularly uh, important and starts off is this debate that we'll look at with Woodrow Wilson and his thoughts on the presidency. So we'll revisit some things, we'll look at the formal formal powers of the presidency and you'll see now we'll add to some concepts that you you already familiar with the Hamiltonian versus the Madisonian notion of executive power we'll see what these guys had to say about it in the second half of class we'll look at this notion of a modern presidency so let me sync this up and we'll get moving okay if you look at the Constitution and 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 if you recall Article 2 is written in a very different way than Article 1. Congress is given a very specific laundry list of things that it can do. The presidency has been given a general grant of power, or at least the argument has been seemingly concluded to this effect that the president has been given a broad general grant of power. If you recall, that's how I talked about it when we, when we were in the Pacific as Helvidius debate. I talked about if I invited one of you over to come babysit for us tonight, which would embarrass my 17-year-old son to no end. Um, but nevertheless, if you were to come over, I, this is how I would grant you power in the House tonight. I would, brand, I would grant you a broad general grant of power, leaving room for you for discretion, that you could do things that I imply to you. If I just say, protect the kids, guard the house tonight, there's a lot of latitude there for you to respond based upon issues that might present themselves. If no particular issue presents itself and you're just playing Monopoly all night with the kids, no big deal. If somebody with an AK-47 is, is outside the house, you're also empowered to deal with that because that's, that's a crisis and, and, and a demand that's put upon you that the Monopoly game didn't put on you. By the way, if you do this, watch my daughter. She always seems to win when she's the banker in that game. I'm not sure what's going on. These are the four formal powers of the presidency. If you were to look at the document, if you have the Constitution in front of you, the vesting clause of the Constitution is the very first line of Article Two. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Hamiltonians read that statement. Barack Obama would read that statement and say that the executive power resides with me, and that's a broad general grant, and it's everything we've talked about with Pacificus and Hamilton and that notion of the presidency. Madisonians would read this and they'd say, oh, that's merely a designation that this particular person will be the President of the United States. And his powers are pretty thin and pretty weak and Congress is really running things. That's the Madisonian view. The Commander-in-Chief 
comes also from Article 2, and it essentially says this. It's in Section 2. The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into actual service of the United States. So now you have a debate about whether the President really is Commander-in-Chief if there's no active war going on or active military conflict of any kind. Can he initiate hostilities? Barack Obama would say yes, contrary to what he argued as a, as a candidate for president. Barack Obama was on record as a senator as saying that the president has no power to initiate hostilities with foreign nations. As president, he has initiated hostilities with foreign nations. The most notable example is Libya. Should we just say Barack Obama is a hypocrite? Well, I might ask you to consider not, not necessarily advocating one way or the other whether you should support the president his policies, but just think about him as a president. Do you want him acting like a senator running for the presidency, or once he attains the office, do you want him acting like a president? I might argue the latter. So. We, we should leave open the possibility that a senator running for president might learn something when he or she is in office, and we might want to judge him or her based upon what we think is responsible once they get in the office. Now, of course, we have to hold people accountable in, in that same light to what they talk about in campaigns, to Natalie's point. You know, we need to, we need to give serious consideration to that. But what I'm trying to do in your four or five months with me is try to give you a sense as, as American citizens or interested third parties to, to be more informed so as these things come up in your future that your radar is a little more fine-tuned, that you just don't knee-jerk react and say, ah, oh, he's a Democrat, I don't think, I don't like anything he does. Well, back up one step and say, think about it from the categories you've gained here. All right, the take care clause comes from section three. And it's right at the end of section three. It's he shall time to time do all these things. And then at the end of section three, it says, and he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed and he shall commission officers in the United States. So this is something Lincoln took very seriously. If you look back at Lincoln's first inaugural address, he alludes to those very words and understands those words to empower him in a very broad kind of way. There are certain laws on the books. They're not being adhered to down south. And it was his legal right, he said, based upon that clause of the Constitution, to execute laws even down south. Yet, knowing that if he tried to do that, which was his lawful legal right, it would be viewed by the Southerners as initiating hostilities. And so he refrained from doing it. So Lincoln showed great restraint in his first inaugural address. The oath of office is the very same oath that President Washington down to President Obama took, and it's here in section, at the end of section one of the Constitution. Before he enter into the execution of office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So what does that formally empower him to do? There is, legally, those words are viewed very, very seriously. If you recall, did anybody watch Barack Obama's inaugural thing, the big pageant that they have, where, that, that the inauguration where everybody's dressed up in nice clothes? The Chief Justice of the United States, a man named Roberts, administers that oath to the president. When he's standing there, the moment before he says these words, he's the president-elect. Once he says these words, he's the president. And Chief Justice Robert botched it, if you recall. And there was some legal question about whether Barack Obama was legally the president because it, it was botched. So later that day, after the party had kind of died down, Chief Justice Roberts was invited to the White House and they did another ceremony saying those words more precisely so that there would be no legal question about whether Barack Obama could act legally as the president. When you combine all four of these, 
this is seen as the formal powers of the presidency. As you've seen already, there are different ways to interpret those four formal powers. This is by way of review, right? This is the Madisonian or the Jeffersonian Whiggish notion of the presidency. And this is, and this is a review, but just to ease us back in here, this is the idea that you interpret those four formal powers narrowly and that they're further restricted by things that are given to Congress. And because it's a narrow grant of power, when somebody's out on the sidewalk with an AK-47, the president has to respond and he has to go outside of his powers to do it. And if you recall, one of the, one of the uh, classic notions of what's called prerogative power, which is when the president has to go outside his legal powers, was when Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Territory and claimed I never had the lawful right to do so. I pray Congress writes that check, but everybody knows that I'm operating outside the Constitution. Any questions about that? Because we, we sort of covered that terrain already. No. All right. Oh, oh, one quick plea. There is no room in that understanding of the presidency for implied powers. The president can only do what he's specifically told he can do. If it's not on the written page, you can't do it. That is, this has been the dismissed view of the presidency. Now, interestingly enough, in your Wilson reading over break, Wilson refers to this and thinks that that's been the history of the presidency. That presidents from George Washington forward, he thinks, have been acting like girly men. And he's calling them out in a certain way. So we'll, we'll visit that. This is the dominant view that that I think we've beaten to death now that you understand. This is how Barack Obama understands the nature of his power. He understands it to be a broad general grant of power. It has room for implied power. And when he has to go and do unusual things because times of crisis and necessity call for it, the argument is things that would have been ordinarily outside his realm of powers become constitutional for him to do. This is the argument Lincoln made. This is precisely the same argument Franklin Delano Roosevelt made when he put Japanese American citizens in internment camps. This would be the argument Barack Obama would make if he had to do something unusual given, given the times. He would never argue that what he's doing is unlawful. Does this mean the president can just do anything? Mm. He has to make an argument that what he's doing that would otherwise be unlawful, that now becomes lawful given the times, is for our good. And if we don't buy it, then we vote him out. That's how the system is supposed to work. So. Okay, so we, we've, seen, we've seen this throughout the semester. Now, in Woodrow Wilson, Wilson is a progressive, if you recall, from our times and parties. We, we talked about who these people were progressives. Progressives were a group of people starting around the late 1800s, early 1900s, and Woodrow Wilson was a university political science professor at Princeton University, and he did a bunch of writing on the government. He'd never served in the government prior to that point. He was later, I believe, governor of New Jersey, and and served in political office prior to becoming the president. But he writes this piece that you had a chance to look at, and I'd like to visit a few aspects of that, because this, these characteristics of the presidency are what Wilson thought the president needed to seek to attain to. He looks back at 100 years of constitutional history in the presidency, holds his nose, and says the president needs to Take his skirt off, excuse me, ladies, right? Men, you understand this. If I say, George, take his skirt off, bud. You, you, that would mean man up, bud. You're, you're acting like a girly man. Get with the program and be who you need to be. That's essentially what Woodrow Wilson is doing in this piece you had a chance to read. So I'd like to revisit a few of these things so you can see this. He is calling, literally, for the president to be as big a man as he can be. So let's visit a few of these and, and, and see what uh, we can make to understand. So if you have this, we'll, we'll look at some key excerpts here now. Wilson starts this piece and he says, the makers of the Constitution 
seem to have thought that the president as what the stricter Whig theorists wished the king to be. Only a legal executive presiding, the presiding and guiding authority in the application of law and execution of policy. Wilson starts this piece and says, this is what he thinks the founders of our Constitution, framers, sorry, framers of our Constitution set the presidency up as. Now look, you've been in a political science class for all of three months now, and you read this. What would you say to Woodrow Wilson today if you read that paragraph based upon what you already know from this class? You actually have something pretty serious to, to offer him. You might have asked him if he had read something you've read. What might you invite him to read? Come on now, be brave, be brave. What have you read in this class that gives you some indication that this is not the kind of presidency we set up? Starts with a P. Come on. What is it now? Pacificus. Look, a hundred years prior to him writing this, there was a debate between people before the ink on this was hardly dry about what the nature of executive power was. And from George Washington forward, the presidency seems to have been that, with some exceptions, how many presidents can you name between Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt? So that's about a 50-year period of time, right? 40. Lincoln dies in 1865, and Roosevelt takes the presidency late in, 1800, in the 1800s. You name any? Can you name any after Teddy Roosevelt? I got one, Barack Obama. How about that? There's an easy one, right? Any others? Oh, please, no. Uh, that's such a softball. That, uh, obviously, you can, right? So what is it about that 40-year window of time that you and I struggle to name names like James Garfield and Grover Cleveland and even notable figures like U.S. Grant and Andrew Johnson and Rutherford B. Hayes. The reason is that those presidents in the wake of Lincoln did act fairly unnotably as president. Congress did essentially run the country uh, in a much different way than you see Congress sort of doing now. After the Civil War, after the passing of Lincoln, Reconstruction efforts were largely guided by Congress. And so Wilson, who's writing in the late 18th, 19th century here, is looking back at the last 30, 40 years of the presidency, and he's pretty unimpressed. So he, really what he's doing is he's looking back at the last 30 to 40 years and he's saying, you know, this, this is pretty unimpressive. The president in modern times and, and Americans of the late 19th century saw the United States as kind of coming of age. We're, we got a real ocean, two ocean Navy now. We, we're sailing this thing all over the world to show off our toys to people. Uh, Interestingly enough, one of the first places that the American Navy showed up to was Tokyo Harbor. And the Japanese took notice of this uh, Navy and did something about it about 40 years later, as you may recall, Pearl Harbor, that kind of deal. Um, so Americans saw themselves as coming of age, and Wilson, because of that, is calling for the government to do something different than what it was doing before. So let's look at the bottom of this page. Well, let's just keep, uh, let's keep reading here because I think all of this is important. So he says, the makers of the Constitution seem to have thought that the president as some Whig, weak president 
only a legal executive presiding in the guiding authority and application of law and execution of policy. His veto upon legislation was his only check on Congress, his only restraint, not guidance, blah, blah, blah. Next sentence. The constitutional structure of the government has hampered and limited his action in significant ways, but he's not prevented it, but has not prevented it. The influence of the president has varied with the men who have been president and the circumstances of their times, but the tendency has been unmistakably disclosed and springs out of the very nature of the government itself. It is merely proof that our government is a living, organic thing and must, like every other government, work out the close synthesis of active parts which can only exist when leadership is lodged in some one man or group of men. Now here's an odd sentence. He says, you cannot compound or make, create, you cannot create a successful government out of antagonisms. What's an antagonism? If someone is being an antagonizer to you, what are they doing to you? Harassing. I'm sorry? Harassing. Harassing you, being sort of uh, in conflict with you, right? If, if you're usually based on like what your weakness is. Uh, mm, interesting, right? So if your little brother or sister is is being antagonistic, there's probably conflict. Wilson is saying that the Constitution, as originally written, was written to invite conflict between the branches of government. True. Absolutely true. If you recall our time past talking about separation of powers. Absolutely true. What Wilson and the progressives are about, and what you need to understand as we look forward in this, what Wilson is saying is that the separation of powers, the scheme that, the, that these guys in brass buckled shoes and powdered wigs set up, needs to go away. That old separation of powers things, which invites conflict between the branches, needs to go away. And Power doesn't need to be separated, it needs to coalesce. And where he thinks it needs to coalesce is the President of the United States. That's what he's arguing for here. So let's, uh, let's continue on our little survey here and, and take a note. Look where he says here, uh, here on the next page, uh, 93. Uh, greatly, well, starting at Fort 92, greatly as the practice and influence of presidents and varied, there can be no mistaking the fact that we have grown more and more inclined from generation to generation to look to the president as the unifying force of a complex system, the leader both of his party and of the nation. To do so is not inconsistent with the actual provisions of the Constitution. It is only inconsistent with a very mechanical Madisonian theory of its meaning and intention. The Constitution contains no theories. It is a practical, it's a practical document, just like the Magna Carta, he thinks. Uh, further down the page here, a couple sentences, he says, a president needs to be a man who will be and who will seem to the country the some sort of embodiment of the character and purpose it wishes the government to have. A man who understands his own day and needs of the country and who has the personality and the initiative to enforce his views both upon the people and upon Congress. Does Barack Obama fit that description? Hello? Does Barack Obama fit the description of a man who will be seemingly to the country the embodiment of character and purpose that he wishes the government to have? A man who understands his day and the needs of the country and who has the personality and initiative to enforce his views on the people in Congress. Why are you so quiet today? Is this, this is, it's not warm in here anymore. Yeah, I mean, Obama fits this description to a T. And to a certain extent, George W. Bush did as well. And Bill Clinton did as well. And so did Bill Clinton's predecessor, George H.W. Bush, and Ronald Reagan, and Jimmy Carter. There's something about contemporary presidents that sort of line up with this. I mean, think about how very different it would be if I were to ask you to describe Barack Obama and you would say something like this, big time paper pusher. The guy pushes paper, he's a clerk. He's, his powers are meaningless. 
Does he speak for the country? Oh, forget it. We never hear from the guy. Wilson was calling the president to be very much what you see around you today. That's really the point of what, uh, of what Wilson and, and visiting this would be. Uh, the president needs to be this national leader. It's only the president who can lead the nation, says Wilson. Now, he thinks that the president should force his views on Congress. What would that do to the separation of powers? If the president forced his views of what he thinks with the direction the country ought to go on Congress, what would that do to the separation of powers? Yeah? Mm. Congress is a mere tool in his hands. How do you think presidents force their will on Congress? I mean, you can't put those guys and, and gals in handcuffs and force them to do anything. How would a president force his will on Congress? Think about that. How could he go over Congress's head? Yeah, and then what would, okay, so, so in case you didn't hear it over the air, so he could go directly to the people and sort of stir them up in some way, right? And then what would the people do? They would vote a certain way. They could vote a certain way. They could vote people into office who think like the president. Or they could make phone calls, write letters, send emails now in, in our day to your congressman or senator and say, I agree with Barack Obama. I encourage you, I demand that you vote this way. That's going over the head of Congress. Congress is supposed to deliberate these things, right? The function of our deliberative body, the, the legislative branch, which we'll talk about next week, is to deliberate, to weigh pros and cons on issues, do that whole thing. If the president is going over the head of Congress, and Congress is flooded with phone calls now, saying vote yes on this or we're going to vote you out, that doesn't add to deliberation in Congress, does it? That's coalescing power under the presidency that's supposed to be, you know, with Congress. So that's, that's what Wilson is advocating here. Um, let's see, uh, she needs to be a political leader. Uh, he's uh, here on the bottom of page 94. He says, uh, last, last paragraph here on the left-hand side of the page, he cannot escape being the leader of his party except by incapacity or lack of personal force, but he is at once the choice of the party and the nation. He's the party nominee, the only party nominee for whom the whole nation votes. Not so with the members of the House and Senate. They're just responsible for local stuff and blah, blah, blah. There's no party, there's no national party choice except for that of president. No one else represents the people as a whole exercising a national choice and as much his strictly executive duties are in fact supporting blah, blah, blah. So, and it goes on in this next paragraph to say that the president is what the nation craves. In these modern times, the nation craves a single leader. Next, this first paragraph uh, on 95. For he is also the political leader in the nation and has it in his choice to be. The nation as a whole has chosen him and is conscious that, that it has no other political spokesman. He is the only national voice in affairs. Let him once win the admiration and confidence of the country, and there is no other single force that can withstand him. No combination of forces will easily overpower him. His position takes the imagination of the country. He's the, you get the point? And he concludes this little sermon by saying, the country craves that kind of leadership. They don't want three separate branches sort of doing their own thing, having conflict. They want a single unifying force, a president, who's going to be a national leader and lead the country in ways that he thinks is best. Now, if you don't pay attention to the political scene much in the country, you can see that Barack Obama has taken those kinds of admonitions seriously. 
And this is part of what the progressives thought was necessary. So what you see today, to, his, to a very real extent, is presidents of our day running with this kind of stuff. So that, I thought that would be an important thing for you to see. Uh, here's another particularly interesting thing that, that is particularly true of Obama that Wilson would advocate. Ah, here it is. Look on page 98. He actually says that the way the president can be this kind of leader is to be a man with great rhetorical or oratory skills. Wilson gave a lot of speeches. In fact, um, you, you may not pay attention to this every January, but there's a State of the Union address. For a hundred years, from Thomas Jefferson to, to, the, 19, to the 1900s, no president went down to Congress and, in a verbal sense, gave the State of the Union. Something was typed up, it was sent down to Congress, and they all read it. Woodrow Wilson starts the, the, the precedent again, and Barack Obama does this to this day, where he actually shows up to Congress and verbally gives the State of the Union address. So important did Wilson think the president's oratory skills were to leading the nation. So he says this here. The Constitution certainly did not forbid the president to back, to back them up as Washington did with such personal force. Well, where is it? Uh, oh, just down here at the bottom of the page, it says the const uh, bottom of this first paragraph on 98, the Constitution bids him to speak and in times of stress and change must more and more thrust upon him the attitude of originator of policies. So he thinks that the president should be a rhetorical leader. We have a very gifted rhetorical leader right now. Some people are arguing that, that he's using his great rhetorical skills right now to divide the country as opposed to unite it. I'm trying to say incendiary things in your mind to get you engaged here in this process. That's what's going on right now. Mitt Romney's going to say Barack Obama was elected to be our uniter and he said he was going to do that. He's not being our uniter. He's using his rhetorical skills now to divide America between the rich and the poor and union versus management and these kinds of things. Uh, Mitt, so Mitt Romney is going to have to be gifted rhetorically to try to circumvent Obama's rhetorical skills. It all goes back to Wilson. There was a day and age in our country, guys, where it would have been very unseemly, it would have been rude, uh, a breach of etiquette for the president to give a speech that would have been sort of a rah-rah kind of speech, a non-policy, vote for me kind of speech. Other people did that for him. The president would only give speeches on just sort of dry public policy. Wilson starts to change that. He started to give speeches where he spoke directly to the American people and say, hey, call your congressman and senator. I think the country needs to go in this direction. Um, what kind of person would be up for such a task? This is kind of fun, given if you have a, a word picture of, uh, uh, of uh, Wilson in your mind. What kind of person would be up to the task of being such a leader? He says here on the bottom of page 101, men of ordinary physique and discretion cannot be president and live if the strain be not somehow relieved we shall be obliged always to be picking our chief magistrates from amongst the wise and prudent athletes. He says, a very small class. You find that funny? Yeah, I mean, well, it is, it's sort of, how many of you have ever read uh, uh, Plato's Republic? Anybody read Plato's Republic? Yeah, a little bit? Well, in Plato's Republic, uh, Plato argues that we should be taking political leadership from a very small class of people uh, and he calls them guardians. The, the best of the guardians might be your king, but the guardian class is sort of the political rulership of an ancient city and Wilson sort of borrowing that kind of, that kind of thing. Okay, so this is what I want you to see as the Wilsonian presidency, but, but look at these items. These are exactly the kinds of things that if we were to sit down today with President Obama and say, are you a foreign policy leader? He'd nod his head. If we were to ask him, are you a great orator leader? He would nod his head emphatically. 
are you as big a man as you can be? Well, in terms of exerting power, yeah. So all of these things that Wilson was advocating, presidents in our contemporary day have taken heed of this, and largely most presidents that you can think of have done this. They've taken their skirt off, and, and they've, they've ramped up. Okay, now we get a little debate between a couple presidents that would have been admonished by Wilson, who wasn't president at this time. Teddy Roosevelt was president from the late 19th century. He, McKinley was the president and was killed. Um, how, many, how many of our presidents have been killed in office? Interesting fact of history, three. Lincoln, McKinley, and who? John F. Kennedy, okay. How many others have had assassination attempts on them? George W. Bush. That guy threw that shoe out. Oh, the shoe, the shoe. Well, that was a pitiful assassination attempt, but okay, if you want to count that. How many serious assassination attempts? That was, a, that was a moment, right? George W. Bush is standing at a podium and, and he sees this guy raise a shoe and he was sort of ducking, a, ducking it, okay. Lincoln had several assassination attempts prior to, prior to, to the successful one. Sorry? Reagan. Reagan. Reagan came a, 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 just a hair literally from being uh, successfully assassinated. A bullet ricocheted off a car that he was being thrown into and lodged just millimeters away from a major artery in his heart that if the bullet had, had, had penetrated that far, he would have bled to death. Any others you can think of? Oh, there's been others. Garfield uh, was shot at, in fact, wounded, thought to be um, others, and some others have been sort of, sort of, uh, Gerald Ford was another that had an a, a attempt on his life by a woman, lady, so. Okay, so Teddy Roosevelt comes to office, and it's the classic, uh, how many of you are Seinfeld fans? Anybody watch the Seinfeld show? Do you remember the Seinfeld episode where Elaine is now the president of the company, and the Urban Sobrero and all that, right? Is this, right? And she's, she's got this meeting around her desk with all her sort of lieutenants and they're planning next year's catalog. And there's this really weird militaristic guy. Do you recall on this? No? No? Well, there's this really odd fellow that finds himself at the desk. And he's really weird and he's really troublesome. And so the best way to get rid of somebody like that in a company is to promote them to an office of insignificance, give them a corner office and they just don't cause any more problems. That's what was supposed to happen to Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was a public official. He was the chief, poli chief of police and police commissioner in the city of New York and was really vigorous about prosecuting crime and he was making a lot of trouble. So they said, we know how to get rid of this guy. We'll, we'll recommend that McKinley put him on the ticket in 1896 as the vice president. We'll make, we'll make Teddy Roosevelt irrelevant and we'll make him vice president. So he can sit around at a desk all day and feel important about himself, but he's got nothing to do. Well, that worked for a while until McKinley was shot and killed in Buffalo, New York, and now Teddy Roosevelt's president. Roosevelt thinks that the presidency should be understood not in some constitutional way, but in some kind of biblical notion according to the parable of the talents. Now, what's going on with the parable of the talents? This is in your realm of knowledge, friends. So what's, what's the parable of the talents? This is from the Gospel of Matthew, amongst other places. So... What's, what's the parable of the talents? Pretend this is one of your 30 units of Bible. Natalie, you want to take a shot at us? What's the...
on him, but when someone owed him something. No, you're thinking of another parable. <laughs> you're thinking of another parable. I think this is in, uh, is it, uh, anybody have a copy of the New Testament on them? It's Matthew 25. The one with the three servants. Yes, this is it. Okay, so, so go for it, Robert. What, what is, what's the parable of the talents? So, Master has three servants. Mm -hmm. He's going away. He places his you know, riches in their care. He gives one, like, I don't remember the exact number. Yeah, five, ten. Ten, thirty. Mm -hmm. like five, ten, and two, if I recall. Yeah, and so the one with five puts his talents underneath the rug or buries in the ground, something like that. Pretty much pushes out of sight. It's safe. And then the other two invest, and they make more. The Master comes back. He's proud of the two servants who invested, made more, but the ones who just hid it away, um, he rebukes him. Yeah, sends him out, and, and the two that, that he did entrust him with are given to the two who invested and did something with it, right? So I go off for a period of time, I invest you with certain a certain investment, and I expect that you'll do something with that investment. If you if you bury it in the ground and merely return what I gave you after, after I return, I'm going to throw you out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and I'll take those two that I originally gave you, I'm giving it to the two more industrious folks who invested it. That's what Teddy Roosevelt thinks about the presidency. He thinks that the presidency is like getting invested with a million talents, and you have to do something with it. So when he argues here at the beginning of what he calls the stewardship theory of the presidency, he says this, the most important factor in getting the right spirit of my administration, next to the insist upon courage and honesty and genuine democracy of desire to serve the plain people, was my insistence upon a theory that the executive power was limited only by specific restrictions and prohibitions appearing in the Constitution or imposed by the Congress under the constitutional powers. My view was that every executive officer, and above all, every executive officer of high position, was a steward of the people, bound actively and affirmatively to do all that he could for the people and not to content himself with the negative merit of keeping his talents undamaged in a napkin. Now, that's, that's Roosevelt's way of saying burying your talents under the mattress or in the soil, as I believe Matthew accounts. So Roosevelt says, look, the president upon taking office has been invested with a lot of talents. He saw his role is to invest those in whatever he thought was good for the people unless he's specifically told he can't do it. And there's not a lot in the Constitution where it specifically said the president can't do it. So Roosevelt is arguing for sort of this conception of the presidency where he is not even arguing constitutionally, he's arguing more hermeneutically about the nature of executive power. His successor, Taft, and that's why I had you read this, has a different view of the presidency, arguably reminding Roosevelt that the president derives his power from the Constitution. And so Taft responds and he goes, look, if Roosevelt's right, then there's some kind of undefined residuum of power. The president, if he can just sort of, in some positive, unabated way, just see things that he thinks are good for the people and try to go out there and do it, that's undefined and, and Taft says, there's no such undefined residuum of power. He understands Article II in a Hamiltonian sense, and this is what he, this is what he argues here at the beginning of his uh, piece here called Our Chief Magistrate and His Powers. The true view of the executive function as I conceive it is that the president can exercise no power which cannot be fairly and reasonably traced to some specific grant of power, and here's the tip-off that he's Hamiltonian, or justly implied and included within such express grant of power and necessary to its exercise. Such specific grant must either be in the federal constitution in an act of Congress passed, but there is no undefined residuum of power in which he can exercise because it seems to him to be in the public interest and then he talks about nothing in the Nagel case. Um, so, so what 
past response is, is he saying, look, the presidency is Hamiltonian. He already has a broad general grant of power. And it's not this undefined business where he sees the president being invested like servants in the New Testament were invested by their master. The presidency has definition of power. It's already broad, but it is defined. You notice, even in this understanding of the presidency, where the Hamiltonian, there are definite limits to presidential power. Under Roosevelt's, that's why I think this drawing is more apt, there doesn't seem to be any limits. If there's something over here that he thinks is good for the people, well, then he seems to see himself empowered for that. The key here is you say this isn't a constitutional argument. What, what Taft is arguing for is more of a constitutional <laughs> aspect here. Okay, that's a little debate I wanted you to see. I wanted you to see that starting around the late 1800s, going into the early 1900s, Wilson comes along and says, look, the president needs to take a skirt off and be as big a man as he can be. And you see the characteristics that he was calling the president to be. And if you're paying even remote attention to the deal, you'll see that Barack Obama and his, re and his recent predecessors, at least, have taken that seriously, and they are what Wilson advocated. The first two people out of the chute in the 1900s is, is Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, and they have a little debate about the nature of executive power. He thinks that it's Hamiltonian, and he thinks this Teddy Roosevelt notion of the president being invested with talents is just baloney. So that's the debate that, that I wanted you to see. Now, in the end analysis, this is how Barack Obama sees his presidency. And this is how George W. Bush saw it. And this is likely, whoever is president in 2013 will see the nature of their powers like this, regardless of whether it's Mitt Romney, Barack Obama, or Hillary Clinton, who might ride in on a white horse and take the nomination. No, she's not going to do that. So. OK. So now we're about to leave this and introduce this notion of a modern presidency to you. But do you have any questions about this before we move on? OK. All right. So what I'd now like to do before we move into uh, uh, to our break is if you were to read, now you, the text that I chose for you all to read in this class um, is sort of a down the middle of the road type book. It doesn't, it's not particularly partisan one way or the others. I could have chosen any number of textbooks. This, this is a copy of the cover of another one that I just pulled out here that, that isn't middle of the road. Most textbooks in American political science are most of the time uh, skewed to the left. They're, they're, they sort of assume that the United States was set up as a progressive state and d don't even make an argument for it. Um, and they just assume certain things about the nature of the presidency and things like that. Um, I've chosen to give you uh, exposure in, in a collegiate setting to something more down the middle of the road and let you all wrestle with, with things as, as you need to wrestle with them. Um, one of the things that is part of a sort of left-looking way at the presidency is this notion of a modern presidency. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what you all think is the modern presidency before we take a break. But just, I mean, if you just flip through chapter 12, which you, of this book, We the People, a concise introduction to American politics, Notice how many times the following phrase is mentioned, modern presidency. The Bush story is, one, is but one in the saga of the ups and downs of the modern presidency. No other political institution has been subject to such varying characterizations as the modern presidency. One reason is that the formal powers of the office are somewhat limited and the presidential power changes with national conditions, political circumstances, and the personal capacity of the occupant. The American presidency is always a central office and the occupant is a focus of national attention. Yet the presidency is not, not an inherently powerful office. Really? If we took this into the Oval Office today, 
and said, hey, President Obama, I, you probably thought you were a pretty big shot here in the scheme of things, but your office, according to our author here, Mr. Patterson, is that your office is not an inherently powerful office. That's going to play an important thought here. Um, public expectations, national crises, and changing national and world conditions have required the presidency to become a stronger office. The writers of the Constitution knew what they wanted from a president, national leadership, statesmanship, command in time of, of war, but they could devise only general phrases to describe, to devise, uh, I'm sorry, uh, they use only, but they could devise only general phrases to describe the president's constitutional authority. Compared with Article I, which enumerates Congress's specific powers, Article II of the Constitution contains relatively general terms on the president's power. Over the course of history, each of the president's constitutional powers have been extended in practice beyond the framers' intention. And I could go on. So this notion of a modern presidency is something that is just assumed in a lot of texts. What is the modern presidency? This will be a test of how well you engaged in otherwise non-slovenly activities over Easter break, where you slept in every morning and had mom make you breakfast and all that good stuff, right? So what is the modern presidency? You got to read a snippet from a book called The Myth of the Modern Presidency. Nichols, Mr. Nick, Dr. Nichols, who writes this book, thinks the modern presidency is a myth. Let's, before we take a break, try to identify what this modern presidency is. Any clue? This would be an excellent time to have this in front of you, looking in your notes and the margins going, ah, I see right here where he's defined what the modern presidency is. Ah, it's not. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, you're on it. But there's one other additional piece. It says that now the um, president has a lot more power than he used to or a lot of other things that he didn't have in the past. Okay. Um, so there's something you're implying there in your good definition. Um, if the president has more powers now than he had in the past, what does that imply about the president today that he didn't have 100 years ago? Or what's true of the president and his powers compared to the Constitution today versus 100 years ago? Remember any of this? A real challenge, you know, to get into some harder reading over the break, I understand. But this is our task, friends. This is our task, yes? The interpretation from the, like, what the framers wrote, the intention has changed, like, interpreted differently. Yeah. To the point, so since you guys are on it, I'll just say it, to the point that modern presidents have outgrown the Constitution. Former non-modern presidents used to, used to behave and exert their powers in a constitutional way. Modern presidents are, are non-constitutional presidents because they've outgrown the Constitution. The thing that pops into my mind when I think about this, and I want you to try to think about the modern presidency in this light, is one of my favorite Christmas uh, animated stories, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. Yes? Do you remember after our little green friend stole all the hoo hash and the trees and everything else, and he's got that poor dog pulling that thing up the slope back up to the mountain to, you know, do his thing? And they get to this point where the sled is precariously hanging on this precipice and the Grinch has to grab the rope. What happened when the Grinch grabbed the rope and was trying to keep the sled from going back downhill? Yes? 
Do you do you recall what happened or? Yeah. I've never seen it. You've never seen it. Who's seen it? What 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 did what did what did the Grinch hear? Nobody's seen this. Am I am I dating myself? Anybody, you haven't seen the Grinch. You stole Christmas. Nobody. No, she did. She came out, but this is afterwards. He's headed back up the mountain with his loot. Everybody, so, so the who's come out, and even after all their stuff's been stolen, they're still celebrating Christmas. And he hears this, and something happens to the Grinch at that point. His heart grows, and what does it do? It busts the little box that used to surround his heart. It grew three times or whatever. So his heart literally grew outside the confines of this little box that was around it, and it busted it. That's what the advocates of the modern presidency think, that the president has grown in his powers to the point where he's busted the box of the original confines of the Constitution, that he is acting in a non-constitutional way, and we can say this without blushing. It's not a problem for him to do that. Nichols thinks that the modern presidency is a myth. He thinks there's no such thing as an unconstitutional or non-constitutional presidency. And he's going to have a little argument for us that we'll consider after the break. Okay, so let's go ahead and take our break. We'll pound through this on the second half of class and I will try to end us a little early so that we can gather as groups while we're all here and get some serious push off to our research that we're gonna need to be doing over these several weeks to generate some nice research papers um, as we go forward is, here. What is it about the presidency in some evolutionary sense that the presidency and its powers have evolved and they've not gotten smaller, they've gotten bigger. And the argument on behalf of those who think that there is something called a modern presidency, Barack Obama is a modern president. George Washington was a traditional president. George Washington operated within the confines of the Constitution. Barack Obama does not operate within the confines of the Constitution. And that's not problematic for those who think that this is real. For those who think it's not real, like Nichols, who you just got a chance to read, he thinks it's a myth. The question we'll want to discover is why he thinks it's a myth. Okay, so, um, so far what we've discovered about this modern presidency thesis is this twofold idea. One is that modern presidents possess and wield more power. So Barack Obama has more power than George Washington ever thought he could have. And here's the key one, that this power has coalesced within modern presidents to the point where they now operate outside the Constitution. And this is not problematic. In fact, advocates of the modern presidency thesis argue that presidents have to do this. As you saw early on here in looking at this, uh, the excerpt I read for you from another text, is that they thought the original presidency was set up pathetically weak and that modern times call for modern presidents to do more and therefore they have to go outside the bounds of the original constitution. All right, now since you all are just a bunch of ball of fire and, and won't talk to me up front here, I'd like you to turn to a neighbor and take a few minutes and talk to each other, which is safer apparently for you today, it's all right, and discuss these two issues. What traits do modern presidents have that cause them to fit this description? In other words, Nichols in this piece identifies characteristics of the modern presidency and he thinks that those characteristics are things that George Washington did not have that now Barack Obama does that makes Barack Obama a modern president falling outside the Constitution and George Washington, I'm just talking bookends right now, I could choose almost any president of modern sort or contemporary sort to call a modern president. 
So what, char what are the characteristics of the modern presidency? And here's your second question. Who was the first man as president to fit those characteristics? Both of those answers are contained here. So take a few minutes, discuss those with a neighbor, and then I'll actually want to hear from you. So generate a little, little ideas here, and let's talk in a couple minutes. Okay, turn to your neighbor. Okay, maybe another minute and we'll we'll reconvene here. Okay. Now the pump the pump is primed, so I've heard good things. So what in the world is a modern president? What do, this piece starts off by saying, 
Nichols starts this piece off and he says, the term modern presidency has become an accepted part of the language of scholars and political commentators. That's why I read you from that other textbook. It's just thrown out like it's an assumption. Few people even question the idea that the executive or these expansive powers of the modern presidency have emerged in the 20th century as an alternative to the cramped legal office created by the founders and framers of the Constitution, right? Um, and exhibited by 19th century presidents. So what do 20th century presidents of, of some point do that 19th century presidents didn't do? Now, no more silence. I heard good stuff. Don't be embarrassed. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I think that because of the economic crisis that happened with the Great Depression, the presidents felt more of a need to kind of step it up and do more economically oh. and socially. Who was president during the Great Depression? FDR. FDR. FDR kind of started like the Great Society. Okay. Uh, that was well, Linda B. Johnson. Yeah, but like, that's not what I meant. I meant um, he came in and kind of like, rescued the Great Depression in a sense and like really started doing more. Or at least one view yeah. of the issue says. There's a big debate about yeah. whether World War II really is what solved the Great Depression. But anyway, all right. So Jennifer has given us some inclination that she holds the rather odd view that FDR was the first modern president. Anybody agree with that? Yeah? What would, what would give you the audacity to make such a claim. Why do you think Franklin Delano Roosevelt is the first modern president? Are you looking for where Nichols says as much? Uh, yeah, do you, do you see it? Okay. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is apparently the first modern president. What did, so Jennifer says that, that FDR started doing some things in association with the Great Depression and trying to pull the country out of that. So what did FDR start? What, what characteristics, what kinds of things did FDR do that Barack Obama apparently still does that makes him a modern president where Herbert Hoover on back to George Washington were traditional constitutional presidencies. So what are the characteristics? It says first the president became actively involved in initiating and seeking congressional support for legislation and consistently used the veto to pursue his legislative. All right. So the president is doing something legislatively starting with FDR that he didn't do. Who wrote the nice summary on um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's wartime stabilization? He sort of did his first inaugural address and then the wartime stabilization. Who? Yeah. Okay, nice. That in Franklin Delano Roosevelt c comes into office in 1932. And I'm saying this to say there's, there's a point here to the, there, there's, a, there's some truth behind the idea of a modern presidency. Franklin Delano Roosevelt comes to office in 1932 and doesn't make suggestions to Congress. He almost gives commands to Congress. Pass this, do this, do that. In the early 1940s when Congress was dragging its feet, he comes and gives a speech to Congress called the Wartime Stabilization Address in which he says, pass this and if you don't, I'm going to do it anyway. Is that constitutional for a president to do this? What if Barack Obama stood at a podium today and says, I don't care whether Congress passes health care reform or not. I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm, gonna f I'm just going to force it on the country. Would he be acting constitutionally? Well, not, arguably not. So something legislatively has happened here with the modern presidency, so we can talk about that. Um, what else? That's one characteristic of the modern presidency. What else? Yeah. Um, their image is kind of different because it says like they're expected to be symbols of reassurance All right. and like, non, having non-political personal qualities. Okay. Um, so there's something about the president as the image of the personification of the country and some leadership capacity. That, that George Washington wasn't, that Barack Obama is, or a better way to say it is, 
something about FDR made him just quantitatively and qualitatively different than his predecessors in this, in this way. Um, one of the really interesting presentations that, that I've had in the, in the history of this course was on FDR's fireside chats. Did you ever talk to your grandparents about FDR's fireside chats? What do you know about those? You know anything about these fireside? These were a series of addresses. Now, now the reason they were fireside chats was that um, it wasn't that people could see the president sitting next to a, uh, a fireplace giving a chat, but people would huddle around their radios in the 1930s. There's no televisions. I mean, think about how quickly the media has changed over two generations. I mean, you talk to your grandparents about what media was available to them in terms of levels of technology, and they'll start talking to you about their, the first radios that they had as the family and that they would huddle around these things. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the first president in American history where m the majority of the American people in their lifetimes would have actually heard the man's voice. Can you ever thought about that? I mean, it's, it's like you can flip on the TV at random today and not only see Barack Obama image, but you can see his, you can hear his voice and that whole thing. So we sort of take these things for granted. So there was something about FDR being this role in the American people's lives that, that previous presidents maybe weren't. And maybe that's a function of technology, but nevertheless. Okay, so nice. Those are two elements of the modern presidency. There are some more. What are they? Yep. So, so modern presidents use executive orders, and that has a way of getting around the legislative process. When a president issues an executive order, it has the force of law. And the argument is that from FDR forward, presidents have used executive orders to go around the legislative process and just sort of make law as they see fit. Hmm. If you just look at the numbers, did presidents issue executive orders before Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Yeah, but after him, a lot more, a lot more. I mean, you've already read two major executive orders, one from Abraham Lincoln called the Emancipation Proclamation, and you read George Washington's Proclamation of Neutrality. So it wasn't as if presidents didn't do executive orders. The argument of the modern presidency is they do it a lot more. Anything else? There's at least one more characteristic of the modern presidency that's out there. I mean, they're just listed here. I just, it's pretty easy sort of to revisit this and see them listed. Um, look at page three. You have this in front of you. It references some guy named Fred Greenstein, which of course you've never heard of. And he, and he lists characteristics of the modern presidency, and he lists four of them. First, the president has become actively involved in initiating and seeking congressional support for legislation and consistently uses the veto as a means to pursue his legislative agenda. Second, a president that normally exercised few unilateral powers become became one who makes policy through executive orders and other actions not formally ratified by Congress. Third, the president created an extensive executive bureaucracy in the executive office to support his legislative agenda and in independent policy making. And then the last one we've identified. Fourth, the office of the presidency was personalized. Presidents are exposed as a symbol of reassurance, possessing extraordinary non-political personal qualities that were traditionally associated with long deceased hero presidents. So here's the four characteristics of the modern presidency. The argument is, on behalf of those who think that there is such a thing as a modern presidency, 
that presidents do these things after FDR, either that they'd never done before, or in the case of executive orders, they do them now with such frequency that they're just quantitatively and qualitatively different than traditional presidents. So these are the four characteristics of the modern presidency. Is Barack Obama a symbol for the government? Yeah, fair enough. Does the president preside over a massive executive bureaucracy? Oh yeah. Would it surprise you? Let's take a building we're familiar with, Metzger. Can you imagine a day and age where the entire, every person who worked in the executive branch of government could have been contained easily in Metzger Hall? How many years ago do you think that would have been true? Comfortably, not crammed in little cubicles. If you took Metzger and you said, everybody from the president on down in the executive branch of government could work in Metzger Hall, what year? Now, that's not possible today. If you go to Washington today and you start poking around, and, and by the way, is anybody going to be in Washington this summer? No, I, I will be there, and I'm, I've got a couple of days to sort of poke around and get some private tours. So if you were going to be there, you could, you could join up with us and get a private tour of the Capitol and whatnot. But anyway, um, if you go to Washington, D.C. today and say, could you show me where all the people who work in the, the executive branch are, they would show you buildings, blocks full of buildings, all kinds of people. At one point in time, that, those group of people that we define as the executive bureaucracy could have comfortably been in, in Metzger Hall, and that's as late as the 1920s. So to Jennifer's point about the Great Depression and FDR and things that he was doing that was new, in the 1930s, the executive branch grew from an acorn to an oak tree almost overnight. It just expanded big time. So people look and they say, from FDR forward, this wasn't around before him and now it is. And that's a trait of the modern presidency. We talked about executive orders. Now the president doesn't just recommend things to Congress, he tells them to do it. He goes like Wilson advocated, go over the head of Congress, don't tell them to deliberate the issue and decide based upon their own will, decide based upon my will says Wilson. And Barack Obama does this today. George Bush did it. Bill Clinton did it. FDR did it. Prior to these guys, the president, it would have been seen as very rude, unseemly, improper for a president to give a speech and say something like this. My fellow citizens, call your congressmen and senators and tell them to vote yes on this measure. That would have been seen as is unseemly. In fact, many people would have viewed it as unconstitutional for a president to do it. But they do it all the time today. My point is that when you look at these four things, there is a point and there is some truth in the modern presidency thesis. Mr. Nichols wrote a book in the mid-90s after this modern presidency thesis had kind of seeped into literature around the presidency and writes a book, a rather controversial book, called The Myth of the Modern Presidency. Turn back now to the people you just talked to a few minutes ago and see if you can sh locate why and where Nichols thinks that the modern presidency is a myth. It's not real. Why does he think it's a myth? Okay, so turn back to your pages here and try to discover his argument and we'll reconvene in a couple minutes to see what progress you make with that, okay?
Good. Good. Okay, how are we doing? Um, so, so here's the operative questions on our slide now. Nichols, Nichols starts here on page two and he says, the modern presidency, like, more, like other traditional myth, is, is, uh, is in one other respect, I'm sorry, it is, it is like more traditional myths in one other respect, it has been accepted largely on faith. Now he's using that term faith as unfounded. You know, I know I don't know if you've sort of found out. You know, I mean, when people say, "Are you a man or a woman of faith?" in our culture today, and you you nod your head yes, that's supposed to mean that you've checked your mind and intellect at the door and come to faith in Jesus. Well, in that same light, Nichols is saying that people who believe in the modern presidency have divorced themselves from reality and come to accept this thesis as a matter of faith without good evidence. All right, fair enough. Now we might ask him, well, therefore, sir, what is it that you've discovered or that you would offer us to show us positively that this modern presidency thesis is a myth? Do contemporary presidents do more than 19th century presidents is a question we'll need to consider in that light. And what kind of original presidency does one need to assume if the modern presidency thesis is in fact a myth? Okay, so what did you discover in your, your uh, commiserations here? Why does Nichols think this whole thing doesn't hold water and is a myth? Madame. Isn't the elements of it were exhibited along with the presidency as well? Ooh. Like, it didn't all just happen at once. I think it's that make up the modern presidency occurred with the past. Okay, so that's a very key element to what he's going to think about in terms of why this modern presidency thesis is a myth. He thinks that there's something true about presidents prior to FDR that were also true of FDR and his successors. So that's going to be a kernel that we're going to have to develop here a little bit, but that's a nice, that's a nice contribution here. What else? I mean, he just, if, you, if you find the relevant portion here, he just kind of lays it out for us. So if you, if you don't know anything more than say, well, I, I think he's got it right here, then just read to us. That's fair enough. Rob, you want to offer it? Yeah, on page 7 it says, all the elements of the modern presidency were exhibited long before Franklin Roosevelt because their source is the Constitution. Truth behind the myth of the modern presidency is that recent presidents do more than previous presidents. That is traceable to the simple fact that modern American government as a whole does more. Keep going. 
It is this broader change in the extent of government action, not a change in the constitutional balance of power among the branches, that provides some legitimacy to the myth of the modern presidency. One more. Okay. <laughs> Relative to the tasks that government performs, modern presidents do no more and no less than presidents have done in the past. All right, that's some pretty fancy language, but Rob points us to a very sort of bottom line to Nichols' argument here. What's, that's fancy language. What's the argument? I mean, what's the bottom line to that? Why did you think that was so operative? You're right. Why, why is this so operative? It's pretty much saying presidents do more because the whole government does more. Huh. But the proportion is the same of, of power alone. And that whatever president, whatever Barack Obama does today, he draws from the same well that George Washington did when he was president. So if we were to interview George Washington and say, sir, on what basis do you think you're doing that rightfully? And he would say the Constitution. If we would go to Washington, D.C. this summer and we could have lunch with Obama and say, sir, on what basis are you doing? Nichols would think that he'd give the same answer. If we got Barack Obama in the same room as George Washington and said, all right, well, let's do a little comparison here. Um, Mr. Washington, did you, did you do a lot when you were president? Yeah. Are you doing as much? Are you exerting as much power as your, your successor here, Mr. Obama? He'd probably say no, wouldn't he? I mean, what's on Obama's plate that wasn't on George Washington's plate? Obvious stuff, guys. What, 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 what is Obama able to do that George Washington never did? Yeah. A lot of, like, kinds of okay. Uh, well, that was a piece of legislation that Obama signed, but he was to the, to the point that the president is kind of a legislative leader. You know, that was, that was Obama's thing. If, if Obama didn't want that, the Congress would never have wrestled with it, probably. So fair enough. Maybe in this, this issue of, of universal or more global national health care, Washington never would have thought about something like that. What else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when Washington had a cabinet, you know, uh, you know, cabinet posts, a secretary of the treasury and things like that. You know, Obama's got those similar kind of people, but there's like a Department of Homeland Security now. How about the military? How many, how many people, when George Washington was commander in chief back in the 1790s, um, he was probably, you know, the commander in chief of, you know, a couple million men in the army, the navy. It was a nuclear arsenal that George Washington was in charge of. You get the point? In that area alone, Barack Obama wields more power. He can, he can make, pick up the phone and military people would move on the other side of the world. There's all kinds of, I've, I've mentioned this movie, Act of Valor. That's a really interesting movie for you to watch. It's, it's not particularly great acting, but the reason is because they're not professional actors. These are real Navy SEALs that sort of participated in a movie. And that gives you some sense of the power that Barack Obama would have. If there's something his military advisors convince him of that the American military needs to move in some kind of covert way, all he has to do is nod and sign a piece of paper, and people on the other side of the world are impacted, maybe killed. I mean, on a daily basis, people are coming into Barack Obama's office with a piece of paper, and they're saying, we think this guy in Yemen on the other side of the world is up to no good. We've got a predator drone, a manless you know, plane, hovering over him right now. If you say yes, a missile will be launched in the next 10 seconds. What do you say, sir? <laughs> Did George Washington do that? Could he do that? So maybe the modern presidency thesis is correct. George Washington just could have never envisioned this. Nichols' argument that Rob's tuned us into here, and I want to look back at page six a little bit more in this regard, is that Washington does more, or does, did less than, than Obama, but it's really a function of something more fundamental. 
the pie has gotten bigger. So if I can, if I can turn this off for a second and, and raise this screen, This is really the heart of Nichols' argument of why the modern presidency thesis is a myth. If we were to say that in 1790, this was the amount of power the federal government exerted, and you say, well, how much of that was executive power? And you say, well, maybe that much. And the legislative power was this much, and uh, we only got three branches, right? And the judiciary, obviously that's not to scale. But you'd say, okay, each branch of our government had a certain slice of that pie. Nichols is arguing this. The pie in 2012 has gotten much, much bigger. How do I complete this drawing? How, so how do I complete this drawing? Just extend, extend the lines? OK, so I extend the lines. And I say, here's George Washington and here's Barack Obama. Does Barack Obama do more than George Washington did? Yeah. But it's only a function of the fact that the pie has gotten bigger. So that branch does more than what it would have done in 1790. And so does that branch. That's the arc. And, and so he says, the executive branch drew its power from the Constitution in 1790. And they also draw from it in 2012. It may be, says Nichols, when George Washington was president, he had these scope of powers available to him, which includes signing pieces of paper with Hellfire missiles firing off in other parts of the world. But they weren't available to George Washington. They're available to Barack Obama, and he can do this constitutionally. So maybe during George Washington's presidency, he only had to sort of use that much of the reservoir of presidential power. Maybe Barack Obama just uses more. Maybe if this was like just a big hose, maybe we've just turned the faucet on a couple more times because modern government calls for modern presidents to do more. But the myth of the modern presidency is that the presidency has outgrown the Constitution. So getting back to our Yeah, get on there. Getting back to our, our question here, what kind of original presidency do you think Nichols thinks was on the table such that this modern presidency thesis is a myth? Does that make sense? If George Washington, if, if, the, if, if Barack Obama and all other modern presidents have not outgrown the Constitution, what version do you think Nichols thinks was the original model of the presidency or executive power? Do you think it was Hamiltonian or Madisonian? Sorry? Did somebody, I'm sorry, did somebody say something over here? And you'd be right. The modern presidency thesis holds only if one assumes that the original presidency was Madisonian, because that's easy to outgrow, right? That's like uh, you putting on you, you, clothes that would have fit you 20 years ago. Well, it's easy to see that you've outgrown those. So Nichols' argument is this. One would only assume that the modern presidency thesis has force, that the president has outgrown the Constitution, if you first assume, as I read to you in the other text here a little while ago, that the original presidency was set up as this pathetic, weak little legal office. Well, yeah, sure. That's easy to outgrow that and say that modern presidents have outgrown the Constitution. What Nichols' argument is, is that the modern presidency thesis is a myth because the original presidency that George Washington possessed was Hamiltonian. And Barack Obama possesses that same kind of presidential, presidential powers. That's really the bow tie for our, our semester long discussion about the presidency. Is, and if you read Nichols' book, if you're, if you're ever interested in this, you could read the whole book. He has a whole chapter laying out the Hamiltonian understanding of the presidency 
and demonstrating that presidents from George Washington forward have operated under that conception for the most part. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.